He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. He said that when David sort of came on to him in that way, pressured him, he sort of snapped, um, became very violent, and as a consequence of the 30 or 40 blows to David McNee, uh, that caused his death. Welcome back to Crimes NZ with me, Jesse Mulligan. Just warning, some of the content and details in this episode won't be suitable for younger audiences. In 2003, television personality and interior designer David McNee was beaten to death in his own home. His killer, Philip Edwards, was found guilty of manslaughter after using the partial defence of provocation. At the time, it was dubbed the Gay Panic Defence. University of Canterbury law professor Elizabeth MacDonald has analysed the killing and the court case involving the well-known TV personality. It uh, got quite a high profile in the media, which always, of course, then carries with it quite a lot of critique and public concern, as this mm. case did. Um, so at the time, um, he had been involved in some kind of reality TV programs um, in the designing line, sort of My House, My Castle, and I, and I think Changing Rooms as well. And um, so I think in the Auckland scene, he was pretty well known. He was um, 55 at the time that he died and uh, living in Auckland. And what happened that night, 20th of July, 2003? So uh, you have to remember that um, what we do know about ha- what happened comes mainly from the survivor. So it's, it's kind of his story rather than obviously the story of, of David McNee. And I think this is why people do get concerned about these kind of cases, um, as they did with um, the Grace Mullane trial, really, is that the person who's died doesn't really get a voice that necessarily is their own and authentic. Um, but allegedly what happened, uh, according to Edwards again, and this seemed to be um, agreed by the sentencing judge in, in terms of uh, the, the, the series of events, uh, he hadn't long been released uh, from prison, about 10 days earlier. He, I think at the time, was, was living on the streets or, or without a, a home as such. Um, and he was 24 at the time. He was in an area of uh, K Road where I think, you know, it was, it was known at the time that that was a place where sex could be bought. And he was very aware that David McNee was uh, one of those men looking for for that service. Um, and there was an agreement that he would perform a solo sexual act in, in front of David McNee. And according to him, David McNee suggested that they go to his house and uh, Edwards could have a shower. And after that, things progressed, according to him, beyond what he had agreed to do for money. Uh, and he was not into any kind of homosexual sex. And so he said that when David sort of came on to him in that way, pressured him, he sort of snapped, um, became very violent, and as a consequence of the 30 or 40 blows, which he initially told the police he did to David McNee, uh, that caused his death. Um, It sounds like, and there was some medical evidence to suggest that he didn't die immediately, um, and in fact... Edwards talked about covering him up with a blanket because he was staring at him. And he used that time before he left to sort of ransack the house. He took his car and some money and some alcohol. Um, And over the course of the next eight days, um, proceeded to drive around, spend the money, drink the alcohol. Okay. Uh, We've got an excerpt from an RNZ Checkpoint interview with then presenter Mary Wilson and reporter Jennifer Dan. And this was following a police media conference held outside David McNee's St Mary's Bay home, July 25th, 2003. And at that stage in the investigation, police said they had several positive leads. This audio comes courtesy of Nga Taonga Sound and Vision. The forensic team has turned up a couple of pieces of uh, what they believe may be useful evidence. Uh, they found them in the garden outside the house. It's a two-storey house above a gully. And uh, the media have been allowed to take photographs of 
some of the foliage that has been squashed down in the in the garden there, where they 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 won't say what exactly what it was that they found, but of course the fact that they've uh, taken it away for examination means it may be of use to them. Have the media been allowed inside his house? No, that's still a um, a scene that's closed, uh, obviously for evidential reasons. Now they're also talking about strong leads and connection with a number of people being seen in David's car. Tell us more about that. Well, the officer in charge of the inquiry, Detective Senior Sergeant Lance Burdett, spoke to the media outside the house today. He said uh, overnight they had two calls from the public which were of a help. They were sightings of the car, a black Audi convertible, which was seen at a food outlet in South Auckland and a retail store in the central city. The sightings were of at least two people in that car. It's a two-seater convertible, and they can't say whether it was two or more, but they believe it was at least two people in the car. I'm speaking with Elizabeth MacDonald uh, about the murder of David McNee, or the killing of David McNee, rather. How would you characterise the media coverage at the time, Elizabeth? Well, I think, again, because he was a high-profile, well-known character, it was... You know, there was some time between his death and finding out and charging the person responsible. And when when he was charged, um, I guess it put that lifestyle into the mainstream media in a way that it may not have been before. And it picked up on and, and sort of played into the, the debates around not just the provocation defence, but also uh, against, you know, purchasing sex you know, high-profile status, people living the life that he was living compared to the life that Edwards was living at the time. How long before police arrested Edwards? Uh, I think it was not long after they... Well, I think it was sort of eight days before they arrested him and they he initially denied being involved at all um, and it was only when they said that they had evidence of... Uh, his fingerprints being found at David McNee's home that he actually admitted killing him and, and said at that stage, evidently, he thought that he was gay, McNee thought that he was gay and he isn't, so therefore he killed him. So it was this claim early on after he acknowledged being there and being the person responsible that he, he relied on this this claim that it was to do with him being a homosexual and, and Edward not wanting any part of that. OK, I'm quoting now from The Listener where Peter Wells wrote about the case. Quote, in the media, McNee was called an interior decorator, television celebrity and a man with an, quote, out-of-control sexual appetite. The man charged with his murder was a young Māori whom the media called homeless. This neat apposition, interior decorator and homeless man, set the stage for a theatre piece by which society could play out its values. And was that played out in the trial as well, Elizabeth? Well, I think I think it was. There was certainly reference in the sentencing decision of the judge to say that, you know, that the time just prior to the murder, or to the killing of Mr McNeith, McNe- is that he had been taking more and more risks and had numerous and varied sexual liaisons with men. And then there was also all the information about the lifestyle that Edwards himself was living. This wasn't the only time he had been paid to have sexual encounters with men, although he said that he he never went beyond, you know, solo sexual acts, if you like. Um, So all that material became available in the media. And and I think it became one of those cases that sort of engaged the public and made more visible the questioning that, you know, lots of people had, had been undertaking, certainly in the academic arena for some time, about the appropriateness of a, of a provocation defence and, and really the victim blaming that comes with that. Yeah. So would you outline the Crown's case then? Well, they were very much of the view that this was uh, a murder, so it was undertaken, and not only did he cause the death of David McNee, but he had the appropriate guilty mind, if you like, mens rea for it, which is either he meant to kill him or he uh, did some acts which uh, he must have known would be likely to cause death. You know, that's that's what they were trying to argue. I think he had actually agreed to plead guilty to manslaughter earlier on, but the Crown proceeded with the trial on the basis that they obviously thought that they had a reasonable possibility of getting a conviction for murder. 
And they very much saw this in line of this was um, something he did as part of, of a robbery, and he had previous convictions for not this kind of offending, but certainly for robbery. You've referred to the provocation defence, which we're going to talk about today, but the defence also argued that Edwards uh, repeatedly said he never meant to kill David McNee. Is that Was that a sort of a second defence or a, was that part of their plan? Yes, well, obviously the, those are two ways that, the, pro, that the man's sort of verdict could have been delivered. One could have been he had no intent, uh, and intent has quite a few different meanings in the context of culpable homicide. Or it could be that he did intend to kill or had the requisite mens rea for, for murder, but he was provoked into the killing. And at that stage, that would operate to reduce what would otherwise be murder to manslaughter. So I think sensibly, probably as a strategy, you know, the, the defence would argue both those things. And remember, the Crown has the burden of proof in those kind of cases. I mean, there was no issue about the cause of death, but the Crown needed to prove beyond reasonable doubt that he had the relevant guilty mind. Um, and also, if provocation was a live issue on the facts, that they had to disprove provocation, again, beyond reasonable doubt. So, you know, tactically, um, the defence would have tried to raise a doubt about both those things. And what about this phrase, the gay panic defence? Can you explain um, that to us and, and how the provocation defence became known as that? Um, yes, it's a little bit complicated because most of these cases are really framed um, as sort of unwanted homosexual advances. You know, a gay man came on to me and the argument is, is that that is so unpleasant and so unpalatable to, to a straight man that that would provoke them into losing self-control. So some people talk would prefer to say unwanted sexual advance as opposed to gay panic because inherent in that gay sense of gay panic is that they don't want to be thought of as homosexual. There's something bad about homosexuality of itself. It carries with it the sense of homophobia, which may, of course, be un underlying... Uh, that kind of homicidal response anyway to a homosexual advance. Um, so it was sort of seen as, oh, my goodness, um, this can't be right. This is really, um, you know, taking me out of my, you know, I'm losing the self-control I have of a reasonable person. Uh, and, you know, there has been, and I, I, I'm not quite sure I would get it wrong if I decided who to attribute to this, but it's only ever been really argued in the context of, of a gay man coming on to a straight man um, because, of course, many women would say that they have suffered unwanted sexual advances, but there are not you know, huh. hundreds of men lying dead in the street. Either. Uh. So it's, it's, seen, it's seen very much um, as, as a particular response to sort of challenges to male heterosexuality. Yeah. Was it a rare defence otherwise, though? Um, I know that you were involved in the Law Commission reports that, that looked at the, the times this had been used. Yes, yeah, so the, the Law Commission did do a report, um, I think back in 2007 is when they published their report and an investigation into whether the defence should remain or, or be abolished or replaced. Um, and one of the things um, that they did and that I was involved in sort of helping with the analysis was accessing all of the cases over a period of time in both Auckland and Wellington where there was a charge of homicide and seeing how many times provocation was raised as a defence and how many times it was successfully argued. So of 81 cases, um, so this is between 2001 and 2005, um, there were 15 of those 81 cases where provocation was raised. Now, I don't recall and I don't know if this information was available at the time, but whether all of those, whether the jury was directed on provocation in all those cases. But what we do know is in only four of those cases was provocation actually successfully relied on. And we say that because, you know, as I said before, a, a manslaughter verdict can be because it was sort of accidental that the person didn't intend to, or it could be that provocation was successfully relied upon. Now, we do know that in the um, the case of David McNee, the, the sentencing judge did say that, in her view, provocation was the likely reason for the manslaughter verdict and sentenced 
on that basis. But interestingly enough, although over time um, there's been a real concern about the reliance of the defence in cases where men have sort of been sexually challenged, um, either because their partner has left them or they've said that they were no good in bed, for example. There's some very famous uh, New Zealand cases um, where that's been argued. But in the four cases in the work that the Law Commission did, two of them related to unwanted sexual advances by gay men, the killing of David McNee and the killing of Barry Hart, um, also a 56-year-old man killed by a younger man who was also then, then took his money in his car. And the other two cases were a case actually where a woman um, killed her violent partner and the fourth case was a son who killed his mother who was suffering from uh, quite a serious debilitating disease. So in that sample we get a sense that what was actually being successfully relied on uh, was this kind of fat pattern. Um, and it was not being successful anymore uh, in the kind of Clayton Weatherston kind of case. Yeah, which we we might get to. And now, by the way, what was the result of this jury trial of Edwards for the um, murder or and or manslaughter of David McNee? So uh, he was convicted of manslaughter. So uh, so that meant he was not convicted of murder, and he was uh, sentenced to nine years uh, in prison. And he needed at that time to complete two thirds. Okay, and and so does that mean that his provocation defence was successful? Yes, that was the judge's view. Um, And I remember I said that provocation would only have been actually before the jury if they had determined that it was actually an intentional killing. So the evidence seemed to suggest that that part was satisfied. He did intend to kill in terms of that requirement for murder, but then the Crown hadn't actually disproved beyond reasonable doubt the fact that this could have been a killing under provocation, which meant that he had to lose the power of self-control that a reasonable person would have, and that's what caused the homicidal attack. We've got some more archived audio to play now. This is again courtesy of Ngā Taonga, and this is RNZ reporter at the time and an old friend of mine, Monica Holt, following the sentencing in 2004 in the Auckland High Court. Today in court, Mr McNee's brother-in-law stood up and gave an emotional account of the impact on the family. John Oliver, who's been a lawyer for 40 years, spoke at length about the effect on Mr McNee's mother, Eva, who's 85 and wheelchair-bound. He said she was extremely close to her son and now the light of her life has gone, her health has worsened. David was her everything. Um, she lived his achievements um, with him and would defend him even if he was wrong. Although David lived in Auckland, He visited her in Waikanae whenever he could and he phoned her without fail twice a day. Mr Oliver said Mr McNee had three lives, one with his family, one with friends and a third which ultimately led to his death. He said Eva McNee knew her son was gay and accepted it. He read lyrics from the Alton John song Circle of Life as a tribute to his brother-in-law. In sentencing Edwards, Justice Freighter said a jail term at the upper end of the scale for manslaughter was appropriate. The beating you gave to Mr McNee was callous and cruel. His behaviour towards you may explain why you reacted as you did, but it does not justify taking his life. That's uh, RNZ from 2004 reacting to the sentencing. I'm speaking with Elizabeth MacDonald about the death of David McNee. And some were very angry at the verdict, Elizabeth. Yes, I think that is certainly the case. And and I think a lot of that came... I mean, I think there was that general concern about how the provocation defence was working in practice, but also the message that that gives. Um, and again, I think you talked before about Peter Wells' incredibly powerful piece in The Listener, um, where he, he sort of said that... it. Well, he did say it evoked in me a sense that homosexuals living in New Zealand were still second-class citizens, almost humans, who would never get full human rights. So I think there's a sense, again, that, you know, you you can be partially excused from killing someone on the basis that they are, are gay and in that kind of situation where it wasn't that he was someone who was not consenting to be in the house and engage in some kind of sexual activity, that that could be... He could be excused in that way from from what was very violent offending. By the way, did you come across a play from earlier this year uh, as part of the Auckland Pride Festival and the play was called Provocation uh, and was all about 
that provocation or so-called gay panic defence? Yes, there's been there's been quite a lot of, of kind of creative things that happened too. There was mm. a great documentary made by a woman called Susan Potter uh, where she talked about, not, you know, things following that too. And one of the... <laughs> One of the issues that I've talked about and written about in the past is the fact that we have an ability to say something about these kind of offences being hate crimes in the Sentencing Act. We have it as an aggravating feature, but it's really not used. So it seems to me there's clearly a connection between people who would respond in this way in those kind of circumstances coming from a position of homophobia uh, or hatred of, of gay men. OK, and we'll mention this other high-profile case that used the provocation defence. That was Clayton Witherston's trial for the murder of Sophie Elliott. And tell us about that, because I think that was one that many people listening will remember and and probably led to a rejection of the idea of this being an acceptable defence. Well, yes, so this, this was much more of the kind of case that had you know, that, that many feminists, I guess, including myself, had been worried about over the years, um, how easy it was it you know, for men to claim, well, she was going to leave me for another man or she had another man and, and that sort of put, pushed me over the edge. Um, and he, he was making a similar kind of claim that she had sort of sexually rejected him. Um, he had a narcissistic personality that made him feel that slight incredibly strongly. And so when he killed her in a very um, violent um, knife attack, and people can read about how many how much that looked like and how terrible that was um, in her own home with her mother at least present in the house. Uh, that was his defence, that um, she had provoked him in her actions by wanting to end the relationship. Um, and because he was particularly susceptible to that kind of slight. But also what happened in that case was that it was you know, a lot of his... Because he gave evidence in that trial uh, and and gave supporting evidence for that claim that he was provoked. Um, and that was screened um, and in people's living rooms. And that, I think, made it very apparent that there was a problem with this kind of claim being able to be made. In fact, people felt so um, distressed about that that um, his lawyer at the time, Judith Ablett Kerr, had acid thrown over her car and received death threats, which was obviously incredibly disturbing and totally inappropriate. But it showed the kind of level of distress faced by people of seeing this kind of argument playing out in our courtrooms. And I think that really was the turning point because, um, you know, the, the Law Commission had recommended in 2007 that the offence um, be abolished and that it could be any kind of provocation could be taken into account in the sentencing process, given that there had been a move from mandatory uh, life imprisonment for murder to a discretionary, albeit, you know, in exceptional circumstances. But nothing really happened about that until the Weatherston case. And I think that really did shift, for example, the views of Women's Refuge, who were concerned about the offence being abolished and leaving nothing for women who might huh. feel in an abusive um, situation. Yeah. So, but having seen that and I think realising that it's actually more used against women um, than for women, uh, that this might be a time to, to, to implement that reform, and which is what happened. OK, and so it was, a, presumably it was a common law defence. Um, no, it was in statute. It was Section was 169 it? of the Crimes Act. Um, okay. And uh, there was a lot of case law under, under it because it wasn't a particularly well uh, or elegantly drafted uh -huh. <laughs> piece of legislation. Um, but no, that was removed um, from the Crimes Act. Yeah. And what sort of impact has that had since then? Well, kind of, I guess, consistent with what I talked before about the, the relatively few cases in which it, it becomes sort of accepted that this person acted out of provocation. Um, it has been raised in a few cases, um, and the Court of Appeal has talked a bit about the kinds of provocation that might impact on not, not reducing murder to manslaughter, because the clear legislative intent was that that's not possible anymore, but certainly moving to a finite sentence, so rebutting the presumption of life imprisonment. But one of the things that didn't happen, which the Law Commission did recommend, was, and this would, was partly to respond to the concerns from Women's Refuge and other sector workers about getting rid of the defence in terms of the position of, of women, 
is that the, at that stage the Sentencing Council was due to be set up uh, and they were of the view that the Sentencing Council should consult widely on the kinds of things and the kinds of situations where provocation should be seen as a mitigating factor. Now, that didn't happen because with the change of government, the Sentencing Council um, was abolished. And so what we have at the moment is though we have part of the, the sort of the law reform package that the Law Commission recommended, we don't have that other bit that's allowed sort of um, public intervention or input, I suppose, into what should happen in these kind of cases in terms of disposition. You've been listening to Crimes NZ with me, Jesse Mulligan. A huge thanks from me to all our guests for their recollections and knowledge of these hugely impactful cases. All the episodes of Crimes NZ are available on the RNZ Podcasts page and they're also on Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio or wherever you get your favourite podcasts. Don't forget to follow the series and if you enjoyed it, give it a rating so others can find it too. 